Greetings all and welcome to Dave's Craft Room and on today's video I am making an American classic double wedding ring. The time has finally come for us to accept this challenge. To prepare for this, I have pulled some of my resources that I have. So I just want to show you some of the things. Pretty Most people are probably familiar with a double wedding ring quilt because it is a classic. But before we start, I just want to read you some of the things that have been written about it. This book is 101 Patchwork Patterns. This, I think, is like a classic book. This is a reprint of it, but it's originally from 1962. This is what it says. First line. This double wedding ring quilt should not be attempted by anyone except a real quilt enthusiast. The gatekeeping, I mean, I don't think we need to gatekeep. You know what, I encountered this type of like gatekeeping somewhat often in old quilting books and unfortunately from some people in the quilting community that just assume things are too hard. I've had a lot of people, encounters of people who just assume that I'm not going to be able to do it. You know what I mean? I actually get that a lot. My reception is very like, oh, you shouldn't try that. I think it comes from a place of humility of saying like, it's gonna, like we're trying to protect you from doing things that are gonna be too hard. I don't think it's gonna be that hard. Believe it or not, the friend from whom we got this pattern boasts 720 small blocks in her counterpane. Mighty nearly all different. I guess I do live in a different world because I pieced my English paper piecing quilt by hand, every piece with a needle and thread, and that had 3,000 pieces in it. Each of my 100 days, 100 quilt blocks quilts has over 1,000 pieces. The Bonkers one probably has 5,000 pieces. My 365 houses quilt has over 7,000 pieces in it, so I'm not scared of 720, no offense. I found here a clipping from a magazine from 1978, June. I do not know what magazine this came from. It says here, the double wedding ring quilt is possibly the most often made pieced pattern in the entire repertoire of American quilt makers. I'm not sure if that's true. I, I might have said like a log cabin would be more popular just because it's so much easier, more people have done it. These I don't really see people doing nowadays. In terms of historical, yes. However, we have to remember that there's a bias towards those quilts which are still around. I think quilts like this mostly, if it was given as a wedding gift, I think they mostly sat in a trunk. So those quilts that are probably more popular to do, which like for example, a log cabin block, were used more, used and abused, and they're now torn and tattered and they're not still around anymore. So we always have to remember the bias towards quilts that are not really used because those are the quilts that survived. But anyway, let's keep reading. There is hardly anything in print about the history and origin of this design. It has been largely ignored by quilt historians. That might have been true in 78, it's probably not true anymore. Probably because none of them has been able to find out for sure when or where the design was created or by whom. There aren't even folk tales about it to satisfy our curiosity. Hmm. That's interesting, and it's actually, it's true for multiple different kinds of quilts, and, and the reason is because a lot of that stuff was not written down, unfortunately. I find it interesting that there's not even folk tales about it to satisfy our curiosity. Although facts about the design elude us, it is likely that it began to be a big favorite in the Depression period, the 20s and 30s, because it is essentially a scrap quilt, the only kind most people could afford to make in those lean days. I take issue with that. To me, this type of quilt strikes me as quite extravagant, quite indulgent. And I think there's a tendency that's now changing, it's now shifting, but there's definitely a tendency to romanticize the past and to just assume that everybody was poor and everybody was scraping together every scrap that they could to make a quilt. Based off of the things I have read, I really don't think that was true, especially a quilt like this. The quilts that they were making, that poor people were making for their families, they were truly utilitarian. We have always taken using scraps and making scrap quilts as a sign that people were poor. Don't we all do it? A lot of quilters like to use scraps. I don't need to be poor to not want to just haphazardly throw things away. You know what I mean? It, it would still be wasteful. I see no reason to think that just because someone is making a scrap quilt, it's a sign that they were poor. You know what I mean? So I take issue with that, but let's keep reading. 
Whatever its origin, by the 1940s, it had become a standard among piece designs, as basic to the quilter's pattern file as the casserole was to her recipe file. Evidence for this turned up in countless attic trunks during the last five years or so, when many people were re-evaluating the quilts left them by the previous generation. Does that not lend credence to what I just said? The fact that they were in trunks in the attic, they were not being used or they were only being used on special occasions. They were the good china. This was when you bring out the good china. So they were only being used once or twice a year for special guests or special reasons. As proven by the fact that they turned up in attic trunks. In most examples we have seen, the open space in the center of the rings is usually cut in one piece such as in the alternate method presented on the next page. Sometimes the pieced rings are appliqued over this piece, perhaps because this procedure seems easier than inserting it into the rings. However, the pieced version looks better in our opinion, and we encourage you to try it. It isn't the easiest of patterns, but not unreasonably difficult either. Now see, that's better. I appreciate that type of language to say, this is a challenging pattern, but you can do it. And so they mention the open space in the center of the rings is usually cut in one piece. I do prefer the method where that center piece, this one called it pillow shaped, that center piece is cut in one piece. I just prefer it. There's a version of this where each ring is cut into four and you piece units with that wedge shape in the middle. And then there's a, seam down the center of that piece. I prefer to cut that in one piece. I just prefer to have it one piece in the middle. I, I know it is challenging, but guys, nothing in my craft room scares me. I don't know if you're new here, but <laughs> I'm not as scared of no fabric. You know what I mean? Like, I think it looks better too. It, it may be easier to do it the other way, but I think this way is better. So I'm going to proceed with this way. I don't mean any offense to anybody that wants to do it the other way. By all means, it's your craft room. You should do whatever you want in your craft room. I kind of want to try it the old fashioned way. I'm still going to davitize it, but it's kind of somewhat of the old fashioned way. Why not piece one block for a pillow to clear up at least one question for yourself about this classic design? Namely, do I dare try making one? Yes, I do dare try. Let's look at this. This is the Encyclopedia of Classic Quilt Patterns. I really like this book. I'm not obsessed with the binding method that they choose because the pages keep falling out, but... Double Wedding Ring is one of the most loved of all quilt designs and one of the most challenging to piece. Again, this adaptation cuts piecing time in half by incorporating the several tiny pieces that usually make up the arc into one large piece. So yeah, that's, that's an option. You know, in some of them, I'll have to put pictures on the screen. In some double wedding ring quilts, the arcs, which make up the ring, are pieced with scraps. You can also do it by just cutting that out of one piece of fabric. And that's okay too. And what am I gonna do? Well, I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> this actually comes with quite decent templates for you to use. So I'm gonna use them. They couldn't fit the pillow on one. It's not called a pillow at all. They couldn't fit this piece uh, on a page so that you have a fold here. That's fine. It's easy enough to do the same with this, but I did it yesterday and I made a template. This is the template. I can probably do this in a week or two. I never know how long a project is gonna take me. I also can't guarantee like how much time I'm gonna have to work on it. A quilt like this, I just feel like you have to, I'm gonna regret saying this, you have to hand quilt it because it's so quintessential that it just feels wrong to me to machine quilt it. But that's just me. I see no reason why you should think the way I do. I've already put some thought into how I wanna do it. And I have a pile of solids. Okay, here's some. I just finished my kitar quilt. These are scraps from that. These are a mess, but as well as these solids from various quilts. What I wanna do is cut we're, just, we're calling it a pillow shape. I don't think it's really pillow shaped. We're gonna cut that center piece out of these solids. They're gonna be solids of different colors. And I will probably pull more than this as well because this is not a beautiful and lovely selection by my view, but they're gonna be solids. There's not gonna be one color. You don't typically see that. Typically you do see one color used as, you know, the, the, the that center piece. These I can use for that small 
wedge shape, like an orange piece um, that goes in between. I, I won't be able to get very much else other than that out of these scraps. And that's what's gonna be kind of the background to it, where most people, or I don't know about most people, but often it's muslin is used. Then, for the actual rings, paper. Paper piecing. Scraps. I'm gonna use these to paper piece, foundation piece scraps. That is gonna be so fast because I don't have to cut out the individual kind of square, like rounded, squarish shapes that would have to be very accurate and could only be cut with a template. I don't have a ruler. They do make rulers for this. I don't buy rulers that you only need for one quilt. I would rather find a different way to do it. And it's paper piecing. I think this is gonna be my best bet. And I, I did this last night. I traced that. I drew it on the paper twice. My printer's running out of ink, so you might not be able to see this, but I just put it on this piece of paper twice and then I ran it through the scanner printer, copy, and got a bunch of them. And then I can cut them out, you know, I, and I can put another piece of paper behind or two sheets of paper behind and cut out multiple at a time and hopefully have enough. This, in all honesty, this is all the paper I have. I might need to go to the store and get some more paper, but that's what I'm gonna do. I, I did piece them last night, hold on. So these you can see, I did do an alternating pattern back and forth. I plan to do kind of a potpourri of all different things and some of them will follow a pattern like this that's alternating, some of them will not, some of them will be totally random. Maybe I'll try to do like this one's going to be all green and then I'm going to use my design wall to arrange them in a way that's beautiful and lovely and piece it. And this, out of all of the out of these references, this is the only one with piecing instructions. And of course there's multiple ways that you can piece it. I happen to think that this method that they have you do is the best way. It's not gonna be easy. We will find a way. According to this, women with nothing did it in the depression. So if they can do it, I can do it. So let's get started. And the first thing I'm gonna do is take these and take Mount Scrapmore and, and piece a bunch of these. Just a bunch. I, I'm not counting right now because I'm gonna get them on the design wall. I kind of figure out how many I need as I go. And the last thing I wanna say before I get started is, I am not personally a huge fan of a scalloped edge with bias tape binding. I just don't really vibe with that. Although that is the most traditional way to finish this quilt, I'm gonna square up the edge. And the reason I am going to is because I prefer it. That scalloped edge is very pretty. I don't necessarily go for pretty. So I understand why some people do choose it that way, but I am gonna just square it up. And that's kind of the way I would prefer to do it. So here I go, I, uh, we're piecing, we're piecing these first.
If you didn't notice, this video is a little longer than my normal videos and that's because I like to tell the whole story of a quilt from beginning to end in each one of my videos. I don't necessarily explain every step. I don't really think of my videos as beginner tutorials. There's a lot of those out there already. My target audience is those that already know how to make quilts and are just interested in seeing what other projects are out there. So I'm not necessarily gonna go slow and explain each step. That was never really the intention behind my channel. And of course, beginners and non-sewers are welcome here, and you may learn something along the way. I do explain some things once in a while, but often it's as I'm learning it or right after I just learned it myself. I'm really not an expert in any position to teach, and I really don't gear my videos towards teaching per se. My videos are more about sharing my art and process and telling the story of the quilt rather than teaching techniques. So if you like the style of video that I make, please consider liking the video and subscribing to my channel. I publish new videos like this every other Tuesday. You know what, people, um, this quilt is actually quite hard, <coughs> but I can do it. I, I can do it. Let me just put that there. I think once I get started, it'll go smoother, but it's kind of hard to get started. Okay, let me put a diamond thing in there. Okay, I'm kind of getting the hang of it, but it is tricky. These circles might be a lot bigger than what I originally intended. I pictured them a little smaller, but that's okay. That's gonna be quite a, um, quite an effect. Yikes! Okay, this is like, th like part of three circles. Great! Let's continue. Six. 
Oh, that's everything. Okay. I'm gonna piece this. I'm just gonna piece it right now. I'll explain what I'm doing later. But for now, I'm just gonna piece it, kind of. I'm gonna piece a thing. Okay, so, hold on. I'm gonna use my small design board to help me chain piece. I think this should work. Take this over there and work off of this and kind of chain piece that way. Footballs, or some people call them eyeballs. They have to go where they go because of this. See that green has to go and it'll be a four patch eventually. So this one has the purple on the bottom. All right, we have our first row pieced. I did not show you how I pieced it, but I will show you later in the video. I just wanted to figure it out for myself before I worry about filming it. So what I'm gonna do next is piece as many of these pieces as I can. Once I have those done, we can get everything on the design wall because I already have all of the other pieces at this point done. Let me just piece some more of those and then we'll proceed and I'll show you how I actually piece the circles and everything a little bit later. I'm going to piece the footballs first so I can get the footballs out of the way. There's so much pieces involved in the footballs. I'm going to piece the footballs. All right, people. So I'm going to show you how I piece these eyeballs or footballs and basically I kind of chain piece them in small batches of six at a time because I'm worried that, that more than that is gonna, like I'm gonna lose track of them. So basically they get pieced in this way. This onto here, like this, and these onto there. And then we piece this as one unit. And I can also tell you that pretty much when you do curved piecing, the rule of thumb is to put the concave one on top because it's easier to manipulate it into the convex piece. But however, for this one, I find that it is easier actually to manipulate this piece probably because it's smaller. So it's easy enough just to manipulate this and sew it that way. And that's how I prefer to do it. And because I've pieced these paper piecing style, 
it is a bit kind of questionable as to the accuracy of these and because I cut them out with scissors and everything. So we just kind of fudge and we make it work. But I'm going to fold this in half to find the center. And then I put a mark there. This is my Crayola washable purple marker. I put a mark there. Same thing. See, I have marks there and I just pop them together. Place a pin inside. People do tend to pin more than I do. I tend to be quite sparse with the pinning because I prefer to just kind of hold stuff in place. Oh, I do cut off this extra bulk some of the time. So anyway, yeah, I pretty much just pin this there and then line this up and hold it in place and sew it. I'll, sew, I'll show you in a second. And then, I mean, same thing pretty much. I just sew these on. These are a little bit curved, but it's a gentle curve. It's really not that hard. And I pretty much just sew them on. So let's do it. All right, and so I have this here. I line that up with the edge. Start sewing slowly and just coax them together into place and just kind of uh, hope for the best. And we have that piece which we need to iron. And then sew these diamonds on to the edge here. It's easy, I really don't typically pin them. And here I go. Stunning. All right, now let's do the next step. In the first place, I need to iron these. All right, and what I'm going to do next, this still has a crease from when I folded it in half. Fold this in half, too. Put a mark. And I, I use three pins here. Now on this one, I do actually follow the rule of having the convex piece on the bottom and this concave piece on the top. So first let me line up those marks, which are here. Now this seam here has got to line up with that there. And so I just put a pin here and I just eyeball a quarter of an inch. It's good enough. And then same here. And the thing is like this pin kind of has to stay upright. If I go like this, then now I've gotten them out of whack. But I, I can go like, I can fasten it there for now. When I get to the sewing machine, I kind of hold it like this as I guide it through the sewing machine. So I hold it upright. You'll see what I'm talking about in a second. Same thing on the other side. Line up those two places, which are here and here. Now let me show you how I sew it. Okay, line up the edges, the corners that is. Start. And When I get to here, I'm holding this pin upright and guiding it through. And it should, the pin should stay in place as I guide it all the way through. And keep going along. And then we do that again. So I'm just holding the pin there as I guide it through about a quarter inch from the needle. We let Jesus take the wheel because I can't do anything anymore at that point. But then here we go. Now let's check and look, that one is quite decent. That's, I mean, maybe not perfect, but close enough. And same thing. So let's iron this and chain piece the rest of these eyeballs. I always iron it to this side to the inside of this eyeball slit. And here we have our one eyeball for this. Now I've done one to show y'all. I'm gonna now chain piece these remaining five that I have here. So let's do it.
at some point as I was making this, I realized that with all the colors that I chose and the scraps, I was making a quilt that was going to be very, very loud, like a circus. And there was nothing I could do other than just commit and realize that I am Davidizing my double wedding ring quilt. This is a Davidization. I try to make things that don't look like what anybody else has done because quilting is my creative outlet. So I'm trying to think outside the box.
This quilt is constructed purely with curved seams and curved seams are more challenging than straight ones but any quilter can master curved seams. That's really not the most challenging part of this quilt. I think it's challenging because it's constructed with a round circular block and almost every other quilt is constructed with a square or rectangular block. Even the Wanderer in the Wilderness quilt I made last time which featured circles ultimately was constructed with square shaped blocks. This is the rare quilt that uses a circular block and the quilter's mind is very resistant to circles. But we take it one step at a time. First thing is making the actual circles. I pieced them top and bottom first and then added the sides to the hourglass shape. Then I put pillow shapes in between the circles to make rows and once we had rows together my mind could grasp quilt construction based on rows. Granted they were curvy rows but I could deal with it. All right, people, I've sewed a couple of the rows together already, and I'll show you how I add the next row on. I need to make sure that these colors line up to make my checker pattern there. It's easiest to do it this way because you just have one seam going all the way along. And it's a curvy seam, but there's no Y seams. So the first thing I do is use my ruler. I put some registration marks right here in the middle. I'm just using the ruler to find the center of this chunk and this chunk. I need that registration mark in order to make sure that the centers of it line up. This has to be perfect. You have to get it right in the center. I'm now going to flip this row upside down on top. We're going to start pinning. So as I'm pinning, I'm looking out for these landmarks. This seam right here needs to line up with there. So that's where I pin it. And that's one landmark. And the registration mark here that I drew needs to line up with the registration on the other side. And that's the other landmark. And that's literally it. I just pin it in those two places all the way along. And this really is not that hard as long as you know how to do curved seams. Now let's take this mess to the sewing machine and sew it up. Oh my gosh, it's actually coming together. Well, maybe some of them are not. <laughs> so there you see me piece this one layer on. I'm gonna piece the rest of the rows together off camera because if I should film it, I will never get it done. And I just wanna finish. So here I go doing the rest of them. All right, people, the quilt top is done. It is spectacular, very extra. 
And I'm gonna sandwich it this afternoon, baste it together, and then I'm gonna fold up the sandwich and put it in my suitcase because I'm leaving tomorrow to go on a trip. It's now December, end of December, so I will be going home for the holidays soon. And I can take this home and work on the hand quilting at good old mom and dad's house. So I'm gonna do that. I still have the rest of today to sandwich the quilt and then pack my suitcase and get on the road tomorrow morning. All right, so here I am in my parents' house where I stopped for Christmas before I went on to a work trip in January. And I had already quilted inside the ditches of all the circles at this point, and I could not decide what motif to put inside the pillow shape. And I never did decide on one. I decided to do something different in every single pillow shape. And what I'm doing here is I have various round objects I found in my parents' house and a ruler, and I'm just drawing random shapes and motifs on there, which I will go on to quilt. Before I left my mom's house, I did put the binding on the quilt just because after I left my parents' house, I needed to proceed to a work trip to Albuquerque for six weeks, and I knew I was gonna finish quilting it in the hotel, and I wanted to be fully done once the quilting was done, so I used my mom's sewing machine. I did not film it, but that's when I put the binding on, and then I surely did finish the quilting inside the hotel in Albuquerque. All right, people, I'm at this Marriott Hotel in Albuquerque, and I have my quilt here that's done being quilted and it's now going to be time for me to take it down to the coin laundry machine downstairs and wash it so that I can get these horrible lines out. I marked my quilt for quilting with um, Crayola washable markers. I've used these markers many times and they do come out. I'm so glad to have this quilt finally done and quilted. This was such a huge accomplishment, but it's not done yet. We need to wash it and get the lines out so I can finally see it properly. So here I go. All right, people, I got it out of the hotel coin laundry and it turned out perfectly fine. All of those horrible lines from the washable marker did wash off. And now at this point, I'm gonna put it in this box and ship it back home to myself so I don't have to put it in my suitcase so I can make room for all the rest of the fabric that I bought in Albuquerque. So once I get home, then I'll film the outro to the video and all that, and see you soon. All right, I finally made it back home to film an outro, and this is the final result. I put a slideshow here to show some of the motifs inside the pillow shapes, and the final verdict of was this the hardest quilt I've ever made? I guess it was. I've had quilts that took longer. I've worked on quilts for two years before, and this one only took a few weeks, but it was more of a mental challenge to cope with the round blocks and mastering the techniques that I don't use as often. But it is not overwhelmingly difficult. It's definitely doable to any quilter who is inspired to try it. And now that I have mastered it, I'm already thinking of other ways to Dave-tize this design. So anyway, thank you for coming to Dave's Craft Room. Like and subscribe to my channel, and please come again. Thank you.